Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Positive Revolution Show. I'm your host, Dr. O, and I hope everyone had a great week. Today's episode three already, and I have some great topics to share and things to inspire you for the week ahead. And it's been so much fun putting together these episodes as it continually reminds me of all the good happening and the need to stay positive, focused, and avoid negativity and blame. It's too easy to make assumptions and take things personally, but it's not about what someone has done or what you think their intentions are. It's your mindset and how you make assumptions. So let's jump right into it. The first step in the positive revolution is developing a positive mindset. So let's talk about the power of mindfulness and how to improve your focus, be calm in stressful situations, and be in the moment. Our lives are so full of endless distractions. We all need to develop mindfulness to avoid jumping back and forth between things and improving our concentration and attentiveness. A powerful skill to practice is mindfulness. For thousands of years, Buddhist monks have practiced and shared the power of mindfulness, typically developed through meditation and breath control. But you don't have to become a Buddhist or live in a cave. Like creativity, mindfulness is a skill, and it can be learned through practice. Now, I've been practicing mindfulness for about 18 months, and it's really changed how I think, how I act towards others, and how I control my emotions. And I strongly recommend everyone to reference the books in the show notes and start practicing every day. It only takes about 15 minutes to make truly positive changes in your life. Now, mindfulness is about bringing one's complete attention to the present experience on a moment to moment basis. It's about focusing on what you're doing and not trying to multitask. For example, when you brush your teeth, don't think about what you're going to have for breakfast. Only think about brushing your teeth. Focus on how the bristles feel on each tooth. Focus on each tooth being brushed. Mindfulness is about a complete immersion in a particular situation. Mindfulness is about slowing down and being in the moment. It's about single tasking rather than switching between a multitude of tasks and focusing on none of them. Now, the power behind mindfulness is meditation. Simply, it's about sitting comfortably in a quiet space with your eyes closed and focusing on your breathing. As your mind starts to drift, just slowly refocus on your breathing. And this is much harder than it sounds and can take years of daily practice to become skilled at it. Now, daily meditation improves your ability to focus, thus improving your mindfulness. And research has also shown that daily meditation can improve one's psychological and physical health. During meditation, you bring your complete attention to your breathing and slowly gain the ability to avoid thinking of other things. This complete attention to the present improves your ability to focus, which is a large part of being mindful. Mindfulness is a powerful driver for improved thinking. When you think of new ideas or try to solve a problem, a laser-like focus allows you to direct all your energy towards the problem. You avoid the typical nature of thinking about multiple things and not properly applying energy to anything. The ability to control your mind from wandering is the power of mindfulness. And the power is built through the daily practice of meditation. Mindfulness practice should be done during everything you do. When brushing your teeth, focus on just the brushing. When taking a shower, focus on washing each part of your body. When washing dishes, focus on the task at hand. And when you practice mindfulness, you will be much calmer and you will remember what you did. Now, the most boring of activities are great opportunities to practice mindfulness. It sounds easy, but it's really, really difficult. We don't realize how much our mind continuously wanders. In today's world of a million distractions, our lack of attention causes us to really do nothing well. Mindfulness allows us to improve our focus. Mindfulness also allows you to let go of things, and this is important as you become a positive revolutionist. If someone harms you, mindfulness allows you to forgive. Remember, the positive revolution is about having no enemies. 
As you forgive, you will be much calmer and focus on the problem, not the person. Buddhism um, asserts that attachment to negative emotions is the primary source of suffering. So then detachment or non-attachment allows you to let go and develop a non-judgmental outlook towards life and people. And this is what the positive revolution is really all about. Mindfulness allows you to forgive others and let go of anger and hatred. And most importantly, mindfulness allows you to slow down. When you're drinking a cup of coffee, do not read the paper. Just drink the coffee. Savor the taste and enjoy the aroma. And as legendary Buddhist monk Thich Nhat Hanh notes, drink your tea slowly and reverently, as if it is the axis on which the world earth revolves, slowly, evenly, without rushing towards the future. Live the actual moment. Not a bad way to live. So now let's go and get inspired with some positive news. Homelessness is a growing problem across the world. Some amazing people, though, are developing innovative solutions to solve the crisis. One person is Boss Timmer, who's a Dutch fashion designer who designed cold weather gear. When one of his friend's father, who was homeless, died of hypothermia, Das decided to take action. He developed a shelter suit, which is part tent and part parka. His design requirements were matched to the environment the homeless experienced. The shelter suit was waterproof, warm, portable, and good for sleeping. It could be worn like a jacket, and then a detachable sleeping bag could be unzipped and stored during the day. The first time Das showed it to a local homeless man, he wanted two more for his friends, and Das knew his creation was exactly what the homeless needed. Das has distributed 12,500 shelter suits to people in the UK, the Netherlands, Germany, Italy, the US, and also to refugees in Greece. And he's adapted his design to match the local conditions. For example, less insulation for warmer areas. Each suit costs only about 30 bucks, and he has partnered with UNICEF for production and distribution support. And his goal is to create a company as big as North Face so he can channel all the profits to fund his Shelter Suit Foundation. As Das has shown, all it takes is action to start solving problems and helping people. And as a professionally trained designer, he used design thinking to identify a problem understand the user and test and refine his ideas in the real world. It's just a great story of innovation and solving a growing problem throughout the world. Now, another great story is 17 year old Selby Hall from England. After his school shut down at the beginning of the coronavirus, Sebi realized there were a lot of lonely disadvantaged kids who needed to feel cared for. So Sebi raised more than 3,500 pounds for various charities to support young people. He's washed cars and watered gardens and handed out biscuits to strangers to raise money and help others. And Sebi's acts of kindness, kindness has helped over 300 people. And he's also given out 200 packets of biscuits to strangers just to wish him a nice day. Now, if a 17 year old realizes the power of helping others and providing support, what can all of us do to improve our corner of the world? And the final bit of positive news for this week is one that hits home. During the 2020 U.S. presidential election, there was massive hate towards immigrants, mostly driven by lies and racism. But one farmer in Wisconsin became a lifeline to undocumented workers. In an area which helped to vote Trump in office in 2016, John Rose now stood out for his support of the local immigrants working on the area farms. Back in 1998, it was difficult to find workers for his farm. John started to hire Mexican immigrants, and he soon realized they were really hard workers and really good people. But hiring mostly immigrants from Mexico presented several challenges. One, of course, was the language barrier, and another was a very, very different culture. So Rose now and several other farmers recruited a local, a local high school Spanish teacher to help. They started studying Spanish, and they also went on an immersion trip to Mexico to meet the workers' families and understand more about their employees' culture. 
Since the first trip, John has visited Mexico 10 times and over 200 other farmers have joined the immersion trips. And not only are the farmers studying Spanish, the workers are also studying English to ensure everyone in the community can become closer. Even though many of the farmers are Trump supporters, there are less social tensions as seen in other areas of the U.S. Now, this is a great story of understanding the benefit immigrants bring to local communities and how everyone can work together and get along, even with different political perspectives. Now, if farmers in the Midwest clearly understand the benefit of immigrant workers and the value of cross-cultural experience, shouldn't we all be more minded and more open minded? Now, I love these types of stories as it helps to remind me of all the good out there and to be proactive to help others and improve my community. So now let's meet an amazing person, Edwin Land. Now, this week's amazing person is Edwin Land, the founder of Polaroid Corporation. Now, Polaroid now is but a speck of what it was. The company that revolutionized multiple industries was created by one of the most incredible scientists and inventors of all time. Edwin Land, he was a Harvard dropout, a tech genius with a relentless drive for perfection. Before there was a Steve Jobs, a Bill Gates, Elon Musk, or Mark Zuckerberg, a Silicon Valley type story was created in and around Boston, Massachusetts. Land, he was a tech genius founder with amazing ideas, who was relentless and obsessive, and he really changed the world. Land mixed science and art and felt all great products already exist. They just need to be discovered. He invented polarized material for many different products, as well as instant photography. He inspired Apple's Steve Jobs, and he believed in the power of the scientific demonstration, especially turning shareholder meetings into dramatic showcases. Three decades later, Jobs did the same. And like Jobs, Land had an oversized ego, which equaled his intellect, both immense and world class. Both Land and Jobs, they built multi-billion dollar corporations, and they focused on relentless patent protection. Now, Land was a modern pioneer who ran Polaroid for over 50 years, longer than Thomas Edison, Henry Ford, and George Eastman ran their famous companies. The company was truly innovative uh, in technology as well as marketing. Polaroid and Land also worked with famous artists and musicians such as Andy Warhol, uh, Robert Maplethorpe, Peter Gabriel, David Byrne from The Talking Heads, Ansel Adams, and even Lady Gaga. Polaroid supplied them with film for photos and technical feedback as well as the publicity those connections created. As any great inventor, Land would note, you must expect failure after failure after failure before you succeed. So let's review the history of this famous company, its famous leader, and the key inventions that really changed society. Now, Edwin Land, he was born May 7, 1909 in Bridgeport, Connecticut, to Harry and Martha Land. His father was a successful scrap metal dealer. And as most stories of fabled inventors, Land was always taking things apart as a kid. He became fascinated with light and polarization after reading the book Physical Optics as a kid. And he was also fascinated with kaleidoscopes and stereo opticons, which are a type of slide projector. Now, when attending a summer camp in 1922 in upstate New York, which was run by an MIT engineer, he saw a nickel prism and became fascinated by polarization. Now, a nickel prism is a clear calcite crystal that's cut at a precise angle and then reassembled. And a counselor at the camp used a piece of it to remove glare from a tabletop to demonstrate polarization. And one night, driving into town, the car the campers were in almost collided with a horse and buggy. And Land realized that polarization could be used to control headlight glare and reduce accidents and fatalities. 
Light itself is a natural phenomenon, but the concept of making a polarizer in sheet form didn't exist back then. And Lamb became consumed by science and invention. He devoured uh, physics textbooks and read all the science books he could get. Now, natural polarizers were effective at reducing glare and measuring angles of reflectivity, but they were large and expensive. And Land imagined important uses for synthetic polarizers if they could be produced. And almost from the start of his work, around age 13, Land was searching for a product that would improve vehicle safety during nighttime driving. And he thought if polarizers could be placed in headlights and windshields, then they could be used to prevent the glare from oncoming vehicles' headlights. Moreover, uh, because glare would be eliminated, headlights could then be made brighter thereby increasing the safety of nighttime driving. And he started thinking all about this when he was 13. In January 1936, Land explained polarization as the best way to understand the complicated phenomenon is to regard ordinary light vibration as a mass of straws tossed up in a wind. They were blown against a picket fence. All straws are stopped except those which are parallel to the pickets, and all straws coming through are lined up in one direction. A polarizer acts as the picket fence. Now, a polarizer acts like a slated screen with long, thin, parallel openings, and these invisible slats stop all angles of light except those parallel to the openings. And by doing so, polarizers provide the ability to select light waves with particular orientations. And adding a polarizing layer to block light vibrating in that one plane, it removes the glare. Now, Land envisioned the new polarizer to be used in movies and sunglasses, stage effects, even in beauty parlors and laboratories, as well as with photography. The technology was eventually used in sunglasses, photographic filters, as well as 3D film. In 1926, he graduated from the Norwich Free Academy and then entered Harvard to study chemistry. But shortly afterward, he left and he went to Chicago to try his hand as a writer. But soon afterwards, he moved to New York City, and his mission was to develop plastic sheets like polarizers. And he spent basically every day in the public library and set up a lab in his apartment, very similar to last week's story of Chester Carlson. He lived off a small allowance from his father, and he hired an assistant to help with his experiments. Um, they kept trying to grow big crystals, but they kept failing. And a key breakthrough came when Land realized that instead of attempting to grow a large single crystal of a polarizing substance, he could manufacture a film with millions of micron-sized polarizing crystals that were kind of coaxed into perfect alignment with each other. And he knew this was the answer to his problem. But he had three key problems he had to overcome what crystals to use, what medium to support them, and how to arrange them. And they soon learned how to make the crystals very small, a trillion of them embedded in each square inch of cellulose. So they were moving forward, but they were still failing and failing and failing. And his experiments built on those of the British chemist and surgeon William Herapath. Now, Herapath, he had sought with little success to produce large synthetic crystals back in the 1800s that would mimic the natural crystals that were the most useful polarizers that were available at the time. And Land recognized an alternative, and he worked to arrange a mass of microscopic crystals to produce the same effect. And he created fine polarizing crystals, suspended them in liquor, uh, liquid lacquer, and aligned them using an electromagnet. He then pulled a sheet of celluloid, which was a thin clear, thin, clear plastic, through the solution to make a continuous sheet of crystals. As the lacquer dried, the crystals retained their orientation, and the result was a polarizing sheet that was thin, transparent, and pliable. Now, Land's first artificial polarizer marshaled millions of tiny iodine needles into perfect linear orientation using magnetic force, so that light shone through them was combed into polarization. 
And he reversed course and envisioned a plastic material to be coated on sheets of film that would contain billions of tiny like uh, tiny needle like crystals in each square. At first by electric or magnetic fields and later by stretching, the microcrystals were aligned to act as a polarizer. Now, in 1929, with the invention perfected and the first patent applied for on April 26, he returned to Harvard for three more years of study. His work on polarizers so intrigued Theodore Lyman, who was the head of Harvard's physics lab, that he gave the undergraduate land a separate lab all to himself. On November 10th, 1929, uh, Land married Helen Maislin, who was also helping out in the lab, and they hardly had any money, so Land would sneak into a lab at Columbia University to use their equipment. And if he wasn't experimenting, he basically lived at the New York City Public Library, reading everything he could. And a key part of his creativity was orthogonal thinking, and he would fail and they'd do a complete reversal of his approach to the problem. Now, orthogonal thinking draws from a variety of and perhaps seemingly unrelated perspectives to achieve new insights. And this was a key strength of land. He was very flexible in being prepared to explore any alternative that will get him to his goal. He never gave up. Now, Land would always do the opposite. He would often state, um, never go to sleep with a hypothesis untested. And also, every problem can be solved with the things in the room at the time. He, he left Harvard again in June of 1932 without his degree, and he set up a company with George Wheelwright, who was his physics instructor. And the new company, located in a garage in Cambridge, Cambridge Massachusetts, was named Land Wheelwright Laboratories, and they focus on polarization, especially for car headlights. The main focus of the company was polarized light to be used to reduce headlight glare, create 3D movies, lights, and, and other product applications. Um, shortly after they moved from the garage into an empty dairy barn because Land wanted a place that was cheap and secluded so no one would know what they were doing. And the sign at the front of the building reminded everyone what their job was. It said, every night 50 people will die from headlight glare. So it was very clear they were all on a mission and they were all moving in the same direction. And Land, he reminded everyone they were creating an industry, not a business. And he began working closely with General Motor engineers. But unfortunately, the automakers never adopted polarization to reduce headlight glare. Um, Land, he got a lot of press due to the headlight project, but no auto manufacturer would really commit to helping fund the projects. Finally, on June 13th, 1933, Land received his formal notice that his patent was successful, and it was named Polarizing Refracting Bodies. And similar to modern startups, Land and Wheelwright worked just as hard to receive funding to support the business as on the inventions themselves. And they kept working to receive funding to keep the experiments going. And they also did some consulting work for Harvard, MIT, as well as Massachusetts General Hospital. Now, Land's growing reputation helped get more business while the company tried to develop a machine to manufacture the plastic polarizers in a continuous strip. And Land realized they would have to manufacture everything themselves to maintain a very high quality on all the strips. Now the focus was on polarizing sheets and Land's goal was to equip every automobile with polarized headlights to eliminate glare. He wanted the company to invent, design, and construct all the equipment the company needed in-house. As the technology um, they were developing was never created before, everything had to be developed from scratch. All of this was brand new. In 1934, a professor at Smith College coined the term Polaroid. He created it by using polar from polarization and oid, which indicates likeness or similarity, having the shape or nature of something. Um, and you'll find out why that was so important. 
Now, the first sale was in November 34 for $25,000 to Kodak. Um, Land Wheelwright, they sold polarizing sheets for camera filters to Kodak, named it Polar Screen Filter, and additional uh, contracts followed. In November 35, they began selling polarized laminated sunglass lenses marketed as Polaroid day glasses. The lenses removed blinding glare and became perfectly transparent. American Optical began sales in December 36, and by 1939, they sold over 1 million sunglasses. And at the time, this was Polaroid's largest customer. Additional business also continued with very large companies such as Bausch & Long. So one of Polaroid's investors was the owner of the Union Pacific Railway, and polarized glass was installed on the Copper King Railways. The side and roof windows and sunroofs were installed with polarized, gla polarized glass to block out glare, and the double pane glass had polarizers placed between glass sheets. The outer pane was fixed and the inner rotated by a knob, and passengers loved it because they were able to adjust the amount by just turning a simple knob. Then in 1936, the company had its first press conference. Land announced he had the material for controlling headlight glare and viewing 3D movies, which was called vectography. He demonstrated a polarizing headlight system, which unfortunately, as I mentioned before, was never really accepted by the major automotive companies. Um, the only products which really took off were the sunglasses, and that was the majority of their business. In 1937, the company changed its name to Polaroid Corporation. The company was the apple of its time, and later Steve Jobs, he was in awe of uh, land and the company. Polaroid started as a small research and basically a marketing firm, um, becoming one of the best known high tech companies of all time. Um, at the 1939 New York City's World Fair, uh, Polaroid introduced 3D, and this was the public debut of the technology. Visitors to their display bought special cardboard glasses with lenses made of Polaroid sheeting, and millions of people tried the new technology at the fair. Unlike other scientific organizations, Land at the time hired many women from local Smith College, and he preferred art history majors. He felt anyone could be taught the basics. The majority of the women had no science background. Land trained people by asking them to do really difficult things and letting them learn. He just kind of threw it at them and let them figure it out. And he felt the way to make people feel whole was through rewarding work lives. He would say, make the working life of every single American a challenging and rewarding life. Um, he also noted, my whole life has been trying to teach people that intense concentration for hour after hour can bring out in people resources they didn't know they had. And this gets back to mindfulness, too, his ability to focus. While land stream of anti-glare vehicle systems really was never implemented by the automakers, the company was making a really good business on polarizing films. Um, the next key stage of the company was developing products to help the Allies win World War II. In 1940, as the U.S. was getting more involved in World War II, land had the company shift focus to focus solely on helping the U.S. win the war. Land declared Polaroid's only purpose would be to win this war. It completely shifted the company's focus. So in 1941, the company signed a contract with the U.S. Navy for a position angle finder. And this was a device for finding the elevation of an airplane above the horizon. Um, by the time the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, the company had made special filters for various Navy instruments, and they've also developed a uh, machine gun trader, trainer that simulated tracer bullets for the first time. Polaroid began working on special telescopes and different gun sites and optics for reconnaissance cameras and a multitude of other products. With all the work for the U.S. government and military, um, the company tripled in size from 41 to 42. And in eight years since their inception, sales grew almost 16-fold to 16 million. They had over 1,200 employees. 80% of Polaroid's income at that time came from military work during the war. 
um, a special stereoscopic viewing system using the 3D vector graph technology was also developed. Um, wearing the 3D glasses, soldiers could analyze maps of enemy positions in 3D from aerial surveys of battlefields. The images revealed camouflaged enemy positions via, via aerial photography, and a key usage was targeting Japanese defenses on Guadalcanal, which led to the Allied, uh, Allied victory. And as the war drew to a close, Land had to figure out what the company could do next to survive as uh, revenue started to shrink quickly. In 45, sales were 16 billion, um, 16 million, but once the war ended, business plummeted. In 46, uh, sales fell to 4 million. In 47, there was below 2 million. All their profits were going out. Employees went from a high of 1,300 to about 300. And by 1948, sales were only about 1.5 million. However, Land kept investing in research and product development. After the war, Land continued to act as a consultant to the National Research Defense Committee, working on developing the Corona and the Samos pho uh, photographic satellites, as well as a manned orbiting laboratory. The satellites allowed the film to be recoverable as it returned to Earth. Um, Lan, he was also an advisor to President Eisenhower on technology, and he also helped develop the U-2 spy plane. Polaroid developed the optics for the plane, which was revolutionary in photographic reconnaissance and intelligence gathering efforts. Um, the lenses from Polaroid had unprecedented power and resolution. You know, from 70,000 feet, you could delineate people on Earth, and the black U-2 plane was the perfect intelligence gathering device ever conceived at the time. U-2 uh, photo photography uh, was to intelligence what code breaking was in World War II. Uh, Land, he also helped form the Lincoln Laboratory for Air Defense and developed overhead surveillance of the Soviet Union. Um, he also pressed President Eisenhower with the importance to foster a spirit of scientific adventure. In 1957, Land noted people able to revolutionize a weapons field in two years can also revolutionize any particular commercial field that we choose to enter. He was, he was an amazing visionary. Um, he also noted we must begin a rebirth of building using the mind, enjoying the scientific adventure. Otherwise, Russian scientific culture will leave us behind as a decadent race. The country no longer feels the thrill of the scientific life. How can we set off on a lot of enormous adventures under the president in order to stimulate science? So in 1943, during a family vacation in Santa Fe, New Mexico, Land's daughter asked him why she could not see a photograph immediately after it was taken. Now, this simple question changed the world. Land, he walked around that night thinking of this and within one hour he envisioned the camera the film and the physical chemistry that was going to be needed and he quickly realized this required a new kind of camera and film system he had to basically compress all of the components of a conventional darkroom into a single unit and the key was a film that contained both negative film and positive uh, and a positive receiving sheet that was joined together by a small amount of chemical reagents to start and stop film development now, this came to him that night while he was walking around, within about an hour. And coincidentally, his patent lawyer was in Santa Fe at the same time. So they met up that night and they wrote everything down. Everything done at Polaroid was always written down and recorded for the patent lawyers. The system had to be self-contained. He realized that. And he was obsessed with patents to protect his work, and especially this. So as Land would later joke, I thought out the idea in a few hours and then took 30 years to work out the details. Talk about focus. Um, the project, it officially kicked off December 31st, 1943, and in March of 44, he began his own experiments. From 43 to 46, the project was super top secret. And in 45, the company sold about $2 million worth of stock to fund more development. The photochemistry, it re it required to allow for instant photography was extremely complicated. Land was attempting to compress an entire photographic darkroom into the space between two thin layers, especially coated material, naming it one step. 
which described the process and was also the name of a future camera. In February 21st, 1947, Land demonstrated the instant camera to the Optical Society of America. And it took about 15 seconds for the print to develop. And it developed a sepia, which is a reddish brown color. Um, he then began demonstrating the te technology around the U.S., but very slowly. Um, known as Model 95, the camera went on sale in late 1948. Um, it wasn't the most attractive camera, and it only produced sepia prints, um, but it got lots of media attention. It was the picture of the week in Life magazine. Um, they were priced at eighty nine ninety five. They weighed about four pounds, and they branded um, the media branded it the Land Camera. It took about fifteen to twenty seconds between shots. Um, by the first quarter of nineteen forty nine, Polaroid was in the black again, and they sold about nine hundred thousand units by nineteen fifty three. And typical land, he chose the right year, the right place, and very importantly, the right price. At the time, you had to bring your film to a store, develop it yourself, or send it to Kodak. Instant photography made taking pictures extremely easy for anybody. And once again, Land noted, it must retail at just under $95. You see, you can't make money selling to the very wealthy because there's not many of them. And you can't make money selling to the poor either. So he really knew it was the middle class that he had to focus on. Black and white film designated Type 41 was offered uh, in May 1950. And the film had sharper images than the sepia prints, but it also had many issues. Uh, the main one being stabilization. Prints began to fade and they were super delicate. Lots of cameras and film were returned. Um, so Polaroid redesigned the film and they developed a plastic coder that helped solve a lot of the problems. In 1950, sales were about six and a half million with about after-tax profits of 700,000. Um, the company had about 430 employees. Uh, sales increased in 51 to 9 million, and then the year after to 13 million. Um, and sales started growing almost 50% per year. And the company and its products were becoming less of a novelty and they were becoming more mainstream. In 1954, Polaroid developed a small camera called the Highlander, and it was marketed to women and sold alongside the Model 95, as well as a high-end camera they called the Pathfinder. And by New Year's Eve 1956, the one millionth camera was sold in a shop in New Jersey. So they were really bringing out new products quickly. By 1960, the company held 300 U.S. patents in instant photography, including 120 under Land's name and another 700 patents outside the U.S. for instant photography. In 1959, the 80B Highlander camera was then introduced. Um, that same year, they introduced ASA 3000, which was a black and white film. In 1961, Type 55 film was introduced aimed at professional photographers. Um, the film produced both a negative and print, which famous uh, photographer An Ansel Adams was pushing land to develop for many years. Then in 63, Polar Color film and the new Automatic 100 camera were introduced. And the color film took almost 15 years to produce. In July 63, Land, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Um, the company also started development on photocopier technology, and in 1964, they worked with Texas Instruments to share information leading to a two-color prototype TV. So they, they were really focused, but they were you know, spreading out. Um, then in 1965, they introduced the Swinger camera, which retailed for under 20 bucks. And it was a perfect timing as the sexual revolution was in full swing. Teenagers and young adults, they loved the camera. Polaroid sold millions of units and lots of black and white film. The camera even had a photometer that displayed the word yes when the light conditions were right. Um, the camera initially sold really well, but slowly died out when kids got tired of it. From 61 to 65, sales increased about 25 to 30 percent every year. And soon color film overtook black and white, even though it was twice the price and you had to use a flash bulb indoors. But people wanted real life pictures in full color. So in 65, development began on the X SX70, which would eventually transform the company and how people took photos. On the last day of 65, they shot the first color picture in the new SX-70 system. The company's survival depended on the success of the SX-70.
Um, the innovations for the SX-70 were revolutionary. Polaroid needed to create a system for simultaneous development of the negative and positive and also have chemical stability. Land spec the camera as to be extremely easy to use, requiring just the press of the button to shoot. And he felt the camera should fit into your coat pocket. Panels on the body were to be covered in leather. The camera was to be heavily chrome plated um, with the appearance of brushed stainless steel while warm to the touch. It would collapse down to flat and fit in your pocket and be about the size of a pack of cigarettes. The photo would come out as a single non peel apart sheet of film, and this was absolutely one step photography. So you can see Land's focus on design also. The SX70 had a clamshell housing and blended science and art. When challenged about adding expensive leather, Land said, um, The camera deserves leather. You can see how Land heavily influenced Steve Jobs. You know, Steve Jobs, his idol was Land. Um, Land would eventually say the system was intellectually complicated, operationally simple, sort of like the iPhones. The SX-70 involved scientific discoveries, inventions, and technological innovations in chemistry, optics, and electronics. And once again, Land would state, if you can state a problem, any problem, and if it is important enough, then the problem can be solved. Um, he would later recall his discussion with Steve Jobs. He, in the discussion, he noted, I could see what the Polaroid camera should be. It was just as real to me as if it was sitting in front of me before I'd ever built one. And later, Steve Jobs told Land, yeah, that's exactly the way I saw the Macintosh. You know, if I asked someone who had only used a personal calculator what a Macintosh should be like, they couldn't have told me. There was no way to do consumer research on it. So I had to go and create it and then show it to people and say, now what do you think? So it, there's, it's really cool, you know, with both of them. And then in 68, the company was the largest employer in Cambridge. Uh, by 69, sales were close to $500 million. Problems with the SX-70 were the battery life, film curling, film stabilization, stray light, and focusing. And in 69, the company started negotiating with Rayovac to develop batteries for the SX-70, as well as with Corning for lenses and General Electric for a special flash unit. Lan also started to slowly unveil the camera, and he worked extremely hard to publicize it. He noted that from 43 to 73, thousands of employees had no idea about the project. The camera was launched in the spring of 72, and the SX-70 became one of the most remarkable accomplishments in industrial history. You know, it's on par with Chester Carlson's xerography invention, which we all know is, you know, the Xerox. About $600 million were spent on development, um, and the company had to build several factories. They built a massive factory uh, in Bedford, Massachusetts to manufacture neg uh, negative film, as well as several other factories which were built in Scotland and the Netherlands. Uh, massive investments for the company. You know, business was booming, but they had, you know, extremely high internal costs. Um, so there was a lot of pressure on everybody in the company. In June of 72, uh, Land was on the cover of Time Magazine and the article heralded uh, a new age of pocket photography. Minimizing the complexity, complexity of the project, Land described the project to the Photographic Journal in 1974 as, it is an interesting experience to see how all of absolute one-step photography can happen very simply, simply if it happens sequentially, involving both the camera and film in some 200 to 500 steps. He also noted when the film is ejected, Potassium hydroxide and a few drops of water is spread in a layer 26 by 10 thousandths of an inch thick and all hell breaks loose, but in a much more orderly way than that phrase implies. For several minutes, chemical reactions occur rapidly, one step out of after another in that thin sandwich and then progression slowly stops. There is peace again and the picture is complete. Really amazing showman. Um, 
However, problems started right away. Customers started experiencing battery problems. Um, there were shortages of camera. There were flawed film and stabilization problems with the film. Um, almost 300,000 cameras came back for repairs. Uh, in the beginning, most competitors, especially Kodak, saw instant photography as a novelty, not as really as competition, which is typical of new technology. Um, Kodak thought of it mainly as a gimmick, but soon the one-step revolution would begin. Uh, the 1974 U.S. oil shock caused Polaroid share to drop by almost 90%. By 1975, though, business started to recover and sales were about $800 million. The SX-70 quickly became the success Land knew it would be, and eventually the company solved all those various problems. And by 1976, Polaroid had sold almost 7 million instant cameras. Now, unfortunately, the company was dependent on one product to drive all their sales, the SX-70, and competitors were soon challenging. Kodak introduced one-hour photo labs called, uh, called photo maps uh, that produced pictures that were better than Polaroid. You know, it wasn't instant photography, but it was still fast enough for consumers. Um, then the Japanese started to introduce inexpensive 35 millimeter cameras. Now, Kodak was the first customer for Polaroid. They purchased about $25,000 worth of polarized filters way back in 34 when the company was called Land Wheelwright Laboratories. And the two companies had a long partnership until 57. Shortly after Lamb presented Polaroid's color film technology to several Kodak executives, Kodak terminated all agreements to manufacture a negative film for Polaroid. And this gets to be a really interesting part of the story. Um, Kodak started development of instant photography and declared war on Polaroid. At the time, Kodak had about 80% of the U.S. camera market. And the instant photography project was codenamed PL976, later renamed PL974. Um, Kodak engineers, they bought up as many SX-70s as they could, and they took them apart and examined them. But what would come back to haunt Kodak leaders is a quote by a senior executive to his engineer saying, development should not be constrained by what an individual feels is potential patent infringement. Think about that. Kodak announced their instant cameras in April uh, 1976, named the EK4 and EK6, and they produced excellent color photos, but they were pretty big. They weren't very attractive. They could not fit in your pocket um, like the SX-70. Six days after the Kodak announcement, Polaroid sued, asking for $12 billion for 12 patent infringements. And Land was furious. Um, he felt Kodak terribly miscalculated his personality. Kodak thought they could get away with this, but Land stated, we took nothing from anybody. We gave a great deal to the world. The only thing that keeps our brilliance alive is our patents. Now, discovery for the lawsuit and subsequent trial took almost five years. Uh, the trial began in October of 1981, and Land was a key witness. He testified for 13 days. Um, but while this was going on, Kodak sold about 16 and a half million cameras um, with tons of film from 1982 to 1985. And then uh, in September of 1985, the judge declared seven of the 12 patents were violated. Kodak cannot sell nor manufacture the cameras and film, which resulted in a class action lawsuit by Kodak customers. Each customer eventually received about 60 bucks. The, the trial lasted until 1990, almost 14 years after the lawsuit was, fought, was filed and almost 10 years after Land's death. Polaroid eventually won $900 million. Um, it was the largest patent infringement judgment ever, but it wasn't the $12 billion that Polaroid hoped for. But it was critical money for, to help the company um, keep alive and keep moving forward. By the end of 61, Lan initiated research on an instant movie film system. The project was called Sesame and later renamed Polavision. Um, and Lan, he conceived this in 1944. Polavision debuted in the late 1977, priced around 100 bucks, but the system cost almost $700 at release. And it arrived when VHS systems were popular, but it did not offer sound. 
Um, Polaroid spent about $5 million on advertising. They used famous celebrities such as John Lennon and Yoko Ono and Ansel Adams. Um, but unfortunately, Sony launched Betamax two years before. And right before Polaroid announced Polavision, uh, Akio Morita, the founder and CEO of Sony, had visited Polaroid. And when Land showed him the technology, Morita told him it was too late. If it came out in the 60s, it would have been revolutionary, but it was already behind Betamax and VHS. Polaroid, they spent about half a billion dollars on development and another $200 million in 1979, but they only sold about 60,000 units. Millions of dollars of the entire Polavision inventory had to be written off the books in 79. Um, the timing was horrible. When Polavision was released, there was a meteoric rise of electronic amateur photography with camcorders, which were cheaper, and they also had sound, with Polavision did not. Um, in 77, the company had very little debt. Peak employment was about 21,000, um, and their revenue was about $3 billion in 1981. However, losses began piling up. And another issue to the company was Land never really named a successor, which resulted in many top executives who hoped to replace Land they just gave up waiting and left. And at this time, digital cameras were starting to be offered by many companies. The subsequent investment and failure of Polavision was the beginning of the end for Land. In 1980, he resigned as CEO after 43 years. Uh, Bill McCune became the CEO, um, though Land officially ran the company until 81. He officially retired in 1982 at the age of 74, as well as resigning as chairman of the board. Now, Land left Polaroid and started the Rollins Institute of Science to continue basic research on various projects, primarily on a theory of color vision perception he proposed known as the Retinex theory. In 1985, Land sold the remainder of his Polaroid shares to donate money to various causes and to keep funding the Roland Institute. A lot of similarities between him and uh, Chester Carlson. Um, like Steve Jobs in 1985, Land was basically forced out of his own company. Um, after both of them left their companies, the companies slowly lost their edge. Their innovation machines gradually cooling down and falling behind um, other tech companies. And after Land left, uh, Jobs reportedly really screamed and scolded Polaroid management. He called the company without Land a vanilla corporation and told executives, you lost your way and don't matter anymore. Typical jobs. So Land was a quintessential inventor. He never wasted time on Me Too in innovations and was known for working nonstop on many projects. He would often work 20 hour days for months on end and sleep in the office. He wanted to give the world something worth having. He invented two industries, sheet polarizers and instant photography. He invented things people didn't even know they wanted until they were available. He loved battling against the odds and against mainstream thought, just like Jobs did later on. Land was not just an amazing inventor, he also created an organization well ahead of its time. He was way ahead of his time in terms of employee relations. He felt every employee had the capacity for creative work and stressed lifelong learning. He hired many single women as well as single mothers and provided excellent benefits to employees. Um, he stressed ongoing education for all employees because he saw that mechanization was sure to abolish most people's jobs. The company offered sick time, retirement benefits, as well as educational assistance to all their employees. You know, he, he saw uh, robots and things like that before anybody else did. Um, he died March 1st, 1991 at the age of 81, survived by his wife, um, as well as his two daughters. Um, he, him and his wife, they were married for 61 years. So it was a, it was a really strong partnership. Um, for most of the company's history, Land and Polaroid were synonymous. Land was an incredible inventor, scientist, and businessman. He was a progressive leader who hired women, minorities, and focused on social issues. A few key of Land's quotes illustrate his mindset and his vision. 
So he said, if you sense a deep human need, then you go back to all the basic science. If there is some missing, then you try to do more basic science and applied science until you get it. So you make the system to fulfill that need rather than starting the other way around where you have something and wonder what to do with it. Uh, I love quoting all his different quotes. Another great quote was, we live in a world changing so rapidly that what we mean frequently by common sense is doing the thing that would have been right last year. Now, the world is a scene changing so rapidly that it takes every bit of intuitive ability you have, every brain cell each one of you have to make the sensible decision about what to do next. You can re you cannot rely on what you have been taught. All you have learned from history are old ways of making mistakes. Now, there is nothing about that history can tell you about what we must do tomorrow. Only what we must not do. He also said, if anything is worth doing, it's worth doing to excess. Um, you know, Land was CEO for 43 years. He had absolute control of Polaroid, good and bad. He was a perfectionist and obsessive about product design. Um, these qualities made Polaroid great, but it also led to its downfall. Um, once again, Land noted, every significant invention must be startling, unexpected, and must come into a world that is not prepared for it. If the world were prepared for it, it would not be much of an invention. Um, he was also extremely charming. You know, he was great at publicity, he had an amazing memory, very intense and incredible focus. And these personal characteristics were essential to his discoveries. Um, his fanatical persistence pushed him to do amazing and great things. And he was also a great promoter. He had similarities to P.T. Barnum, giving dramatic demonstrations to promote his inventions. In addition, his scientific rep reputation meant a lot to him. He was a scientist, first and foremost. He received 535 U.S. patents, and he was second only to Edison, who had 1,093 patents, the most patents held by a single American. And he was an instrumental in the Allies' win in World War II and fought just as hard in the late 1960s to help formulate and advocate for federal assistance to public educational television. Um, and he always supported science education. In 68, um, him, and his, him and his wife anonymously donated $12.5 million to Harvard to build a science center. And in the 1950s and beyond, he focused on reinventing education. He felt universities were not very effective. He envisioned movies of lectures so students could watch anytime, anywhere. Sound kind of familiar. Um, he also focused on the practical aspect of education. He noted, education must produce people who no matter how tightly they conform to the innumerable commands of society would find one domain where they can make a revolution. Think about that. He also noted that the individual in industry will be better qualified to increase his technical competence and at the same time make his job fully satisfying if he continues his ed education as an integral part of his working career. Um, another example of Land's foresight was in 44, he envisioned a Silicon Valley-like place where about a thousand small science-based companies, each grossing about $20 million a year, as well as spending about 5% a year on R&D, would add about $20 billion annually to the national income and add about 2 million jobs. You know, he could see the future importance of science and business. Um, he noted that his motto is very personal and may not fit anyone else or any other company. And his personal motto, motto is don't do anything that someone else can do. Don't undertake a project unless it is manifestedly important and nearly impossible. So really amazing guy, um, just saw the future and he never stopped learning and inventing. He was an incredible mind, an amazing showman who was able to charm and win over the talented people around him. Um, he changed the world. And once again, as he said, I, I love his quotes, you cannot rely on what you have been taught. All you learn from history is old ways of making mistakes. There is nothing that history can tell you about what we must do tomorrow. Only what we must not do. 
You know, I wanted to repeat that. And just like Chester Carlson, land changed how people lived and worked and really enjoyed life. It's just another amazing person who saw a problem early in life and was driven to find a solution. So now that, that's a great story. It's a long one. But let's now discuss some really cool stuff after we talked about all the land's inventions. Population aging is occurring alongside broader social and economic changes taking place throughout the world. Declines in fertility, changes in patterns of marriage, cohabitation and divorce, increased levels of education among younger generations, continued rural to urban and international migration and urbanization in tandem with rapid economic development are reshaping the context in which older persons live and work. As many of the world's industrial nations face future worker shortages, industry is looking for solutions to allow workers the ability to perform difficult tasks well beyond the current retirement age that we're all used to right now. So one solution is the ectoskeleton. Roboto, robotic ectoskeletons have been shown in science fiction for years, but now these futuristic suits are starting to appear in actual workspaces. An ectoskeleton is a motorized machine, usually made from metal, that's built to fit on a person's body. The machine is created to multiply the strength of its wearer and facilitate proper body mechanics. It makes it easier to lift objects and ease the strain on the body. Ectoskeletons, they're, they're worn to reduce the stress put on the body by performing certain tasks. And in the past, ectoskeletons were used primarily in the medical field to assist in rehabilitation. More recently, they have been used in labor-intensive fields like construction and manufacturing to reduce injury rates. They also assist in lifting and moving heavy objects, as well as to provide a strong support system for handling large machines and large objects. Now, the first wearable machine dates back almost 100 years. Uh, in 1917, Leslie Kelly invented a running machine powered by a small steam engine. The machine was created with the goal of easing the stress put on the body um, throughout the movement of running. It was called a pedometer, pedometer. Um, the machine was patented, but nothing else really came about from it. Then in 1965, a collaboration between the U.S. Army and Navy and General Electric created the Hardy Man. And the goal of this machine was to allow humans to lift 25 times more weight than possible without it. Ultimately, people were supposed to be able to lift over 1,500 pounds. Unfortunately, the Hardy men weighed 1,500 pounds, and it only allowed its operators to walk at about two and a half feet per second, or about the speed of a turtle. And most development of ectoskeletons continued, but mainly in the medical field, to help people gain movement after debilitating injuries, mostly in orthopedic rehabilitation. But now, with the rapidly aging population, many of the world's industrial nations are quickly adopting ectoskeletons to meet the growing demands of older workers. Um, the ectoskeletons, they allow these older workers to continue to perform many difficult and dangerous tasks without injury. Um, it's just going to get more and more, especially in the U.S., Europe, and Japan. Uh, ectoskeletons, they can be full body suits or they can be created to only be worn on specific parts of the body like hands and shoulders. There's multiple types of ectoskeletons that are currently being used right now. There are power gloves which help the user grasp and hold materials and tools. Um, these machines help to strengthen the grip and improve the dexterity of the person wearing them. There's also back support ectoskeletons which help the user lift, bend, and reduce and reach, reducing back strain and injury. Um, these machines really help to ensure proper posture and reduce back pressure while performing a lot of repetitive tasks. There's a uh, arm and shoulder support, which helps contractors who do a lot of overhead work, such as electricians, drywallers, and professionals working on ceilings will find many benefits as the ectoskeleton distributes the weight from shoulders and arms to reduce strain. 
Um, there's also ectoskeletons for workers who crouch or have to stand for long periods of time and require additional support. Those who might benefit the most are once again drywallers as well as brick, uh, bricklayers. And of course, there's the full body ectoskeleton, um, which assists in lifting, moving objects, carrying tools around sites, as well as performing a multiple other tasks. Now, the construction industry right now is at the forefront of ectoskeleton development and adoption. And according to the 2019 U.S. Chamber of Commerce Commercial Construction Index Study, 33% of contractors are expecting to use wearable technology by 2020, next year. And in 2019, only 6% of contractors were using wearable technology. So no matter what the adoption rate is by next year, the use of ectoskeletons is expected to continue to grow in a variety of industries such as manufacturing, construction, and logistics. So don't forget, the roots of many of our current technologies and innovations were first noted in science fiction. And the imagination of so many of these writers foresaw the potential of technology to assist humans. You know, pretty cool stuff that only recently has become more commonplace. And to learn about the past 500 years of how inventions have helped humans adapt and grow... Why don't we now talk about the book of the week? Many things we take for granted today, the ability to travel across the globe in just hours or getting in touch with a loved one who lives in another part of the world with just a flick of a button. The inventions that made so many things commonplace were the results of the hard work and effort of many men and women over the years. Thanks to those brilliant minds and their amazing inventions, mankind was able to make a giant leap into the modern world we live in today. Now, the book of the week takes us on a historic journey of how so many inventions came to fruition and changed the world. Now, The World's Greatest Inventions by David Ellard is a great book for historians, tech geeks, or anyone who wants to be inspired with amazing stories of innovation. This easy-to-read book recounts the 500-year saga of innovation that has shaped the world we live in, from the first pocket watch to the latest nanotechnology. Now, arranged chronologically, each invention is placed in its historical context. Inside the pages of the book, you're going to meet the people involved and discover their ingenuity and persistence, their triumphs, as well as their tragedies. Ellert's experience in science, technology, and innovation makes him the perfect author to share the history of so many inventions that have shaped the world. His writing is clear and easy to understand as he shows how new ideas and innovative technologies have transformed our lives today. And he has not only written many great books on innovation, but his experiences as a researcher in Antarctica, a teacher, he was a radio and TV broadcaster, as well as a government policy advisor makes him the ideal person to share the history of so many amazing inventions. The, the book is composed of short chapters that allow anyone to quickly grasp the achievements of so many great in, and influential inventors. So from the beginnings of ATMs to the inventor of the explosive Semtex to the development of GPS, Eller takes us from one invention to another in an engaging and fun read. And I, I strongly suggest picking up this book and enjoying each story within its pages. Um, I've read several of Eller's other books, and they're all great reads. So if you want to get inspired and informed, the world's greatest inventions should really be on your reading list. Well, that's a wrap on episode three, and I, I really hope you enjoyed this episode. And like I said every week, please share with your friends and family, and please hit the subscribe button. And be sure to check out the links in the show notes to learn more about mindfulness, um, the people doing amazing things in the world, and especially Edwin Land. As we met Chester Carlson last week, this week's amazing person, Edward Land, is another legendary inventor and visionary. He not only created 
amazing products as well as his company Polaroid, but he introduced many corporate initiatives to overcome society's limits on women and minorities in the workplace. And like Carlson, Land was focused, intense, and a selfless philanthropist who helped so many people. I really encourage you to read about him and his amazing life and work. And once again, please be sure to email me any suggestions and questions. Um, and as the positive news stories demonstrated, we all need to take action and drive positivity in the world and our community. So thanks again for watching, and I'll see you again next week, same time, same place.